let's see what this this is about. So how to extract the boundary? Usually, an, an, a simple edge detection will extract you the boundary. But these pixels are not connected to each other, right? Just It's just a boundary. It can be of one object, can be of a different object. So people have thought about this and said, if I have a curve or a surface that I can initialize inside the object and let it evolve and move to extract the object under certain properties of the curve, then I will extract more reliably the contour of the object. So here, we're going to initialize a circle inside the bone and let it evolve. So this is a very simple active contour. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with active contour. I'm going to talk about a different uh, way of doing the active contour, but it has the same uh, approach. So it works well. I, I mean, this method the active contour works well if the edges are defined, okay? But you notice something. Did it get this part? No. no. So it's it's constrained within the object and it's going to stop at the boundary of the object. Okay? So, another way of evolving the contour, so the first one was based on the edges. Evolving the contour without edges. It's based on the region. Okay? So I have some statistic information about the region, the mean, the variance, and I'm going to evolve the contour to extract the region based on this information, without any edges. So here we have any edges? No. No. So let's see how it works. So it's extracted the region just based on the characteristics, the texture, the mean, the variance of, of the region. And here is the same. So we initialize two contours and it, was, it will be able to extract, not based on the edges, but based on, on the characteristics of the region. Okay? So the first evolution was based on the edges. The second one is based on the region. And the third one, a type of evolution, is based on the knowledge base. What is the knowledge base? We talked about this briefly, that you have some template that you want to, that you know that this is a ventricle. This is the object that I want to extract. It's not exactly the object. Find me something similar to this. So allow my template to vary a little bit to match something similar. Okay? So we embed a shape in the image and let it evolve to extract something similar. Okay? So we started with something completely different. It's not completely different, it's similar. But it extracted the object. And this maybe answers some of the questions that you raised that how can we say that using the statistical approach we segment based on just on the gray levels and we have two objects. How can we say that this is a ventricle and this is a tumor? If you have a template for the ventricle, you can let it evolve after your segmentation with the first technique and tell you, yeah, this is a ventricle, this is close to the ventricle. Okay. Another method for the variational method, we're going to initialize three curves and we let it evolve. Again, it extracted what? what the shape of the ventricle. And this is another example of the shape-based segmentation. You start with a shape, and you morph it, and you get to your object. 
Okay? So these are all examples of variational method. It's based on the partial differential equation. You have a curve that you're going to allow it to evolve, and it's going to sh change shape to match your option. Okay? Uh, I think I have an example here. I'm going to use it. Maybe it's not clear, but this has, I'm going to go over this example again. Okay, so what are the advantages of introducing this variational formulation computer vision? Uh, it, mod it modeled the image in uh, the continuous domain, which simplifies the formalism and makes it grid independent. It doesn't depend on a certain pixel location and grid information. And it uses partial differential equation, and there has been some advances in partial differential equation. So the computer vision field is making use of it now. And uh, there are some successful algorithms in uh, existence and uniqueness of the solution. That's why the variational method have gained some uh, popularity. So what are the basics of this active contour or active shape? A curve is defined by some points, and it's parameterized, okay? So every point has a coordinate, x and y, and it's parameterized by the point p, and p goes from 0 to 1. This is how you describe a curve, okay? The curve, of course, is closed if c of 0 is the same as c of 1, okay? You have a closed curve. How about the surface? A surface is a grid of points, so you can expand the notion of curve into a surface. You have two-dimensional uh, indices, and these are the parameters of the curves. You go from uh, R2 to R3, from U and V into the third dimension. Uh, so you have, you have X, U, and Z. This is how you get a surface. Uh, uh, description. Okay, we're gonna represent. So this was what is called explicit, explicit representation of an object. Okay, so you represent a curve by its points. Right, you exp you express the contour of an object by its x and y coordinates. This is called explicit representation. We're going to do some different representation. It's called implicit representation. What is this implicit representation? It's very interesting. We're going to represent the curve as a zero level of a higher dimension function. Sounds confusing, right? You have a three-dimensional function. When the function equals to zero, this is your curve. When the function is inside the object, it's negative. When the function is outside the object, it's positive. Make sense? Can you draw it? Can you draw it? It's here. It's <laughs> <laughs> or this is actually the opposite. So the curve that I want to extract, my contour, uh, the, the is the zero, zero level. Yeah. Uh, when the function is zero, when the value of the function is zero, then this is a contour. When you are inside the function, here it's opposite. It's positive. When you are outside the function, it's negative. Okay? This is how you represent an object implicitly. Okay? So we're gonna embed our curve in a higher dimensional surface. Okay? Okay, so it's function of x and y such that my curve is at the curve is are all the points x and y such that this function equal to zero. Again, my curve are all the indices x and y where the higher dimensional function equal to zero. Yes. Explicit function. What do you mean the explicit function? This is, uh, this is implicit. Okay. Explicit function is you say that 
my contour is composed of the points x and y, x and y, x and y. This is explicit, okay? But here you are embedding your curve in a higher dimensional function. So the function is phi, the big phi. When the function equal to zero, all the points where the function equal to zero is your curve. If you want to represent a surface, you're going to have a higher dimension function. Again, when the function of x, y, and z equal to zero, then this is your curve. Okay? We're going to define the moving or the surface as a hyper, we call it the front, gum. This is my curve that I want to extract. The motion is described by a partial differential equation. So when the change of gamma, we're going to move this gamma, my curve, with respect to t, with a certain velocity. It's going to move with time with a certain velocity, where v is the velocity of the field. OK? So again, this is the implicit representation of a curve. The curve at any time t is a function at the level z. Okay? So this is my higher dimension function. If you take a cut at zero, this is your curve. This is the cut at zero. At any time t, look at the function at zero, this is your curve. So I'm going to allow my function to move, and at any time t, I'm going to look at the level zero, this is your curve that you're looking for. Okay? What are the restrictions of the function? At zero, it's a curve. If you are inside the function, it's either positive or negative. Outside the function, the opposite. Is it an arbitrary function or the final? Is it an arbitrary function or it can be defined specifically? It has three values. It's uh, yes, okay, okay. It um, you can look at it as the distance, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know this. Your functions, phi of x and y, equal the distance from the contour. So you have your contour, you look at any x and y, and you calculate the distance from the contour. If you are exactly on the, at a point on the contour, the distance will be zero. If you are inside, you calculate the distance, but you put a negative sign if you are inside. If you are outside, you calculate the distance from the contour, but you put a positive sign on it. Okay? That's why it has this shape, like the, the bell shape. Okay? As you go away from the contour, you have higher values, but negative values. And the same here, as you go away from the contour inside, you have uh, positive values and higher values. Okay? So it's a function that you allow it to move up and down. At, at any time t, when you look at the zero level, you find your contour. So your function is moving. So it's actually, this is based on an object. If you're allowed to move freely, it's going to move down, and your contour going to shrink, right? Mm -hmm. So it, there is no restriction, right? You just allow it to move. So it's going to go over. All the sections. And then at the end, you didn't stop it. So it's going to shrink. And these are different representation at uh, t equal 1, t equal 2, t equal 3. Again, the zero level is your contour. What's good about this, remember when we use the active contour to extract the bone, what did it do? It just extracted one part of the bone and it left the other part. What's good about the level set representation, when you allow it to move, it's going to extract the both section at the same time. Because it's going to cope with the topology changes. 
Okay, so here you have two parts of the contour, right? Maybe it's not really clear. When it moves down, if they are connected, it gets, it starts to get connected. So it, these are not two separate objects. It connects them. And again, when it moves at t equal t equal 2, then you extract your object. Uh, if they are connected with a certain contour, then it's going to extract. Okay, so why do we use implicit function except uh, instead of the active contour? Because it, it helps with the topology change. Remember, if we have two objects, you need two contours, and we're going to extract them as two separate objects. But with level set, it handles naturally. It's a higher dimensional surface that can extract the two parts of the same object at the same time. It can be initialized manually or automatically, and the implementation is applicable to higher damage. And this is another example of why you need the level set rather than the active contour. So here, if you have an active contour and you want to extract one object uh, where well, it might be interesting. I think if you want to extract the contour of this broken bone here, if you have just one active contour, it's not going to extract it, but the level set actually gets you the actual contour. So this section, if you take this section, actually it has three components to it. So with just active contour, you're not going to be able to extract it. Again, it gets used. As you go down, it gets connected, and it gets split again. OK, and this is what I was talking about, that snakes have difficulty dealing with changing to porous snakes are the active contours. That's why we use the level sets. OK, so the level set, we said that phi at the contour equals to 0. OK, we're going to allow this contour to move. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to t. So with uh, derivative rules, you're going to take the derivative with respect to x and then with respect to t. So you're going to end up that uh, change of the contour of the surface with respect to t equals to f multiplied by the gradient of phi. F determines the speed of motion, okay? So higher value of f, then the motion going to be fast. Lower value of f, then the motion going to be small. Yes? And the optical flow? Not the optical flow. No, no, no. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Okay, we took the derivative. You get these two terms. Mm -hmm. And when you simplify it, you're going to get a value f multiplied by the gradient phi. Then it's different than the optical flow. No, it's not the optical flow. No. And the partial gamma, uh, partial gamma, partial t is not the optical flow as well. Partial gamma. It was something like ten slides ago. <laughs> no, no, this is a derivation. It's the same. It's a, it's a contour. So the change of the contour with respect t. No, it's not. It's a change of the curve with with time. It's not the optical flow. It, it was written uh, partial gamma partial t equals the v, and the v was. The velocity. Velocity vector. Yeah. And this velocity vector is not as that of uh, the optical flow vector. No. no. OK, so let's look at this equation here. The contour going to move with a certain speed, f, that changes, right? We want this contour to stop at the curve, right? So I want this function f to be not to be zero. I want, I want it to be zero when you don't have any gradient. Mm. Right? When or when you have high gradient. High gradient. Zero gradient or high gradient? High I want it to zero. stop at the border. At the border. So when you have a high gradient, I want this function to stop. When you have a very low gradient, I want this function to continue to move. But the gradient is with respect to phi, the curve itself. 
the gradient with respect to the intensity. To the, uh, okay. okay. We want this curve to stop at the boundary of the object. So we want it to stop at, an, uh, at the gradient of the intensity. Okay? So this is a basic equation that lets the curve move. Okay? You let it move when you are inside the object and you let it stop at the boundary of the object. So you let f to be zero at a high gradient. So this is an example of an active contour to extract the kidney. You initialize the contour inside or proximate to the object and then you let it evolve. Okay, so what happened here that we model the intensity distribution within the kidney and we let this guide the F term to stop if you are outside this region. So let's say I don't want to start with just one circle, I want to start with many circles and let the function combine them together. The level set actually handled this very nicely. So at at the end, you look at the function, you look at the level zero, and this will be your contour points. Again, this is the same example. We started by many initial conditions. You say that these are the contour levels that you need to worry about. We constructed the function, the high dimensional function. What is the function? The function equal to zero when you are at the contour, positive when you are outside, negative when you are inside. And it's a distance from the contour. And then let it evolve and stop at the boundary. So ex extracted one object. Okay. So any questions?